And, uh, and what it led me to was a new form of food intelligence. And within, within my research and analysis skills, uh, my interest into Bitcoin, it all kind of coalesced into basically what is now known as the Beef Initiative. And we basically, we're, we're becoming an internationally recognized brand now because of my efforts of getting us back to truth in food. And I think that a lot of people in the United States and across the world have, have lost their, their access to knowing what true food is and what true nutrition is. What's wrong with our health has been, you know, engineered in a way that a lot of people don't understand. And that's my job now is to do a lot of education and saying, hey, there's there's some issues out there and we've got a solution for you. And it's called the Beef Initiative. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating to hear you just just talk about how you know people have become kind of blindsided, I suppose, just to what they're putting into their body. And I was listening to the Safedine podcast earlier on, you know, the, the the Bitcoin Standard podcast. I don't know if you've heard it yet, but he was talking to the the, the writer. There's a new book has just come out um on in Safedine's channel uh, called Fiat Food. And the uh -huh. the investigative journalist guy who wrote that book was on talking to Safedine. And some of the things he was saying really opened my eyes. Just just the fact that, you know, the the types of processed and ultra processed foods that people are, you know, consuming with a big smile on their face these days. Like a lot of these are only you know 40 to 50 years old and they are pretty much poisoning their system. Like what would you say to that? Well, he, he nails it, you know, and safety, safety deserves a lot of credit. He's a good entry point for a lot of people saying, oh, wait, OK, now I have perspective. A lot of people kind of know. I mean, you, let's just use the United States. You know, in my lifetime, I'm, I'm in my 50s. I've seen both sides of this equation when we're talking about fiat food. OK, and what happened in, in Safety Dean, of course, he's a Bitcoiner, so he brings up the fact of 1971 and we talk about how our money got debased and we went off the gold standard. Well, OK, let's look at food at the same time. What happened to agriculture in the United States of America? Well, it became very industrialized and we had uh, basically a government that said you're going to go big or go home. And whenever they said that, what they meant is that we're going to go. And they, they basically told all the farmers and ranchers and agriculture in the United States of America that you will go fence to fence now. We're going to basically turn agriculture into something that we're taking the responsibility that we're going to go feed the world with our bread basket in the United States of America in our form of industrialization. Well, what they were really saying is that our food is going to get debased along with our currency. We're now going to go into what we we, what we had in 1969 was a solid food industry that fed a population and it delivered a pureness of that nutrition. Whenever we went off the gold standard, what we did is we started debasing our nutrition through that mass production, mass consumption, mass industrialization, mass processing. Processing is the key here. The way that we process food now, really the reason it happened is because they had to extend their profit margins further than they had ever had before. And how did they do that? Well, they debased, debased the food. And that's led to a metabolical destruction in the United States of America. Right now in America, 88% of us are metabolically compromised. Well, that's because we sit there and we basically in the United States of America, I tell everybody, and this is to be blunt on purpose and it's not to be rude, but we will eat dog shit as long as it tastes good. And this is what people need to start waking up to. Once they can say, yep, you're right. We don't eat very well. Why is that? Well, it's because we've industrialized and overly processed our consumption models in the United States of America. And we spread that around to the world. And our, now our health is showing that. And that's what basically I think a lot of Bitcoiners, they're waking up to because they, you know, they go with authenticity, transparency, validation before you trust. And so if you're really going to be serious about your consumption model, be it audio, video, food, money, whatever it is, you better get to the source of the seed of where we came from. Where are we now and what are the solutions? So Safety Dean, he, he, hits it, he hits it right on the head 
But then what again, what are our solutions, folks? Nobody's out there creating solutions. They're just talking about the issues. We can't do that anymore. It's time to basically be foundational and to get busy moving to the parallel, parallel food system. And it doesn't have to be the way they did it. It's the way that we used to do it. It's community-based. And it is based on sound money and sound communications and sound relationships. Interesting. Um, I saw a tweet you had the other day, about a day ago, I think it was. There was a guy called Robert Lufkin, MD, a medical doctor. And he posted a uh -huh. picture on your on your Twitter feed of this uh, beach in 1970. And uh, I believe it's in the U.S. somewhere. And, you know, you had all these kind of tanned uh well, you know, toned uh, figures lying about. There wasn't, there wasn't, uh, you know, an obese person anywhere to be seen. And, and you replied to that then, you know, like a, a, uh, you know, he he said, you know, what happened effectively, uh, comparing this photograph 1970 to today. And then you you responded, a harvest of deception, quote unquote, happened. Would you like to expand on that deception part? Sure. What it is 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 okay. Whenever you're you look at agriculture and where I came from, let's just say in Texas, I, I grew up probably about, I grew up personally probably about 75 miles away from the, the epicenter of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Okay. That's when the Dust Bowl happens. And my grandfather stewarded land in Texas in the late 1800s, all the way until he passed in the eighties. And so what are we looking at here? Okay, whenever I say the harvest of deception, okay, what they've done is they've basically engineered a way to rob us of our resources out of our communities. Okay, that's the deception. Because in the United States of America, the most powerful part of our uh, history was founded on agriculture, okay? Okay, agriculture is huge in the United States of America. We've had many innovations throughout the period of time since we've come over here and, and basically stewarded this, this land. Well, the way that we've done it in the last 50 years has now led into a deception that basically is being uncovered. Uh, we went from basically the purity of a seed into genetically modification of that seed, the bioengineering, that seed we have to now use chemicals pesticides herbicides we have to use seeds that will grow in a drought we went and we we basically deception is is within the seed itself within how we've treated the seed how we've taken the seed out of our communities and whenever we do grow our food the communities that used to be fed first are now fed last. So that seed is planted, it's harvested, then it's shipped across the world, it gets about overly processed, and then it comes back to us in the form of a Walmart shelving item. And that's how, basically, that's the deception. Instead of keeping our food and feeding our communities first and foremost, and then sharing that, now we have to wait until it comes back to us full circle. And that's the fiat system. That's the debt economy. That's the multinational corporations and the chemical companies and the grain companies that have modified, that have deceived us of what the seed is now. I know what the seed used to be. The seed is not what it used to be. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. And it's very complex. Yeah, it's unbelievable. These words keep on cropping up, you know, deception. Uh, fraud, theft, a lot of the, you know, in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin circles. Um, I was talking to a guy called Rune Oldstore who wrote a, a, bit, a book called Fraud Coin. I don't know if you've read it. Um, it's pretty good. It's the, it's the history of an history of inflation uh, for the last thousand years. And he makes quite a strong argument that, you know, when people say that inflation is theft, uh, he will say it's not, it's actually fraud because there is, you know, there's deception within that. So it's just fascinating that these, these types of words are popping up in different aspects of, of the fiat world. Um, how do you see, like in terms of Bitcoin and, uh, you know, how has Bitcoin influenced your view on the agricultural industry or how has the agricultural industry influenced you, your thoughts on Bitcoin? Sure. The, the 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 one eye opening and kind of that moment of clarity that I had, I know exactly where I was, and I was like, "Oh crap, 
Bitcoin and beef. <laughs> you know, that's my entry point because I come from cattle country. I'm a cattle man, right? And so what I what I knew from the time that my grandfather taught me about land and cattle and everything and about value, okay? My first question to most ranchers these days, and I'll, I'll kind of spell this out for you. Where's the cat? Where's the value of the cow now? And everybody will look at me and be like, what do you mean? I said, well, I know where the value of the cow was before we, we went off the gold standard. The value of the cow was either in the cow or the land itself. Where is it now? And I asked these ranchers, I said, where, where is the value? Where, where do you see profit in the cow? They don't see it anymore. It's basically, it's been so commoditized and so basically processed, the value of the cow does not go back to the rancher. It does not go back to the community. And so I say, where's the value of the cow? Well, I know where it is because I did my research because I'm a research analyst. The value of the cow now for 90% of ranchers and producers and farmers, basically anybody that stewards uh, cattle in the United States right now, it's in the USDA insurance policy. What is that? Well, that's debt. Okay, who owns that debt? Well, you do as far as the rancher. So you don't have any value of the cow that you can obtain or that you can actually steward and retain. Okay, what does Bitcoin do? Well, it gives you a new store of value of the cow that my grandfather taught me. And that way you cannot be uh, manipulated into that fraud, into that price manipulation. You get to store the value of the cow in the way that you, do not it did not know that is now possible that's a very first kind of talking point that you get but then you look at uh, producers and ranchers that go farm to table with their beef okay they have to uh, they they basically get penalized by the credit card companies for three percent transaction fees i uh, also this is a good uh Entry point and orange pilling for everybody out there is I don't try to sell Bitcoin. It's like, hey, we got a tool. It's decentralized. Uh, nobody can take it away from you. If, what would you say if you don't have to pay 3% to these credit card companies and then you could store that 3% into a store of value that you know we can help you with? That's the entry point for all ranchers. They now will accept you know, Bitcoin to sell their beef Instead of paying the credit card companies 3%, now they're saving that 3%. They don't have to keep it in Bitcoin They can, because they got to run their business. So they can 97% of that can go back into the fiat system. But that 3% now is a store of value that they can start replacing that store of value of the cow using Bitcoin as that store of value, that decentralized sound money that they now are really more interested in than whenever the conversation first started. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, something I, I was wondering about is like with your with the beef initiative, um, how do things look on the ground in Texas? Like how many how many ranchers are involved? What kind of what's the market scene like, or is it all just you know customer to rancher? And also you mentioned before about um this being a global initiative. So give the listeners uh you know a bit of an idea of what you're thinking for the future in terms of expansion. Well, this started with one handshake with one rancher, two men basically having a conversation and deciding to collaborate together. That's where we need to bring perspective into this. You know, what happened in 1971 is that they also told the world that you have to scale, you have to go big, you have to scale linear, linear, linear. This is not about scaling. This is about replicating successes. And so what we do in the Beef Initiative, there are no borders. Right. Whenever we're talking about Bitcoin, there are no borders. You don't have to have, ask for permission. And so what I want people to understand is you can have a beef initiative anywhere. And this is what we've proven. I could I scraped the Internet. I could have had every producer in the United States in an index that they could have been searchable. But I said, we're going to do this holistically. This is grassroots. And so I put three I asked three producers to be in the beef initiative index. Well, now we have close to 200 and they all came in voluntarily. OK, I didn't ask them. They show they, they were able to see the proof of work that we have performed. And so really, I think that we'll be up to over a thousand within the next 24 months. 
because of the protocol of decentralized communications and that form of proof of work that we lead with. We're not a marketing plan. And so let's go back. What does it mean to be part of the Beast Initiative? Well, it means that you have access to processing centers. It means that you develop your own distribution. It means that you are first community-based. You build out locally, then you broadcast globally. Okay, we've got beef initiatives popping up all over the United States. We've got the Florida Beef Initiative. We've got several here in Texas. We've got them all over. Like I said, we have almost 200 producers now. They're all part of the Beef Initiative. We're also feeding orphans in Nigeria. We're also, I've been, I, I toured the whole uh, east coast of Australia. We had nine uh, conferences, summits, Bitcoin meetups in Australia. I'll be returning to Thailand in November, and we're going to establish a beef initiative in Thailand. And so there are no borders here. And so that's what we're doing. That's whenever I say this is an international movement because it's about sound money, sound food, and it's, it's, it goes far more than just about beef. This is about truth in food. So wherever you are in this world, you can have a beef initiative and we build out locally and we broadcast globally. And we've got so many different ways that people can establish their own beef initiative that I'm telling all the beef pointers out there, quit asking for permission. This is a collaboration. It's not a competition. And I think more and more people are going to start seeing it because, I mean, you and I are talking today. You invited me on your podcast because you saw what we're doing. This is how this spreads out. This is not about scaling. This is about replicating successes all across the uh, across the planet. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I look back to you know my childhood growing up in Northern Ireland, and you know Northern Ireland has mm-hmm. wonderful beef, wonderful lamb. And you bet. Yeah, some some amazing stuff, and and I can remember like just you know we've been with my grandmother and grandfather and eating. Mo- it's called Morn. Morn is the mountain. So Morn, black faced lamb, very, very seasonal. You had wonderful, wonderful beef coming in there as well. And I can remember just eating that. And it wasn't it wasn't uh, something that was just a special treat for once a year on your birthday or whatever. It was quite a regular thing to be eating these wonderful lamb chops and beef sticks, etc. And then if you look back to the situation at the moment, the price of these things is just absolutely horrendous. And, you know, my grandmother was a working class lady. My grandfather was a barman. You know, they, they weren't earning mega bucks, but they could afford this food on a regular basis. And if we fast forward 25 to you know, 30, 25 to 30 years in the future, it just looks like with you know, governments have just inflated everything away to not away to just you know, astronomical proportions with the money printer and now people can't afford to eat good food. Is that, is that a fair, a fair, fair reflection? It's a great reflection because you bring your own personal experiences to what you used to grew up that you grew up with. You, you can validate that there is a deception going on here. And there definitely do. This is nothing new in, in humanity. We've always had basically people controlling the seed, controlling market access. Let's talk about market access. Whenever you can eliminate market access to nutrition, then you have more control over those people that you govern. Okay, and that's what's going on right now. In the 70s, we had a global industrial food shift. That's whenever they started inserting a lot of fake commodities into our food systems, from all the seed oils to high fructose corn syrup to everything that's led to this metabolical destruction. Well, that was because they inserted and they took away market access to that animal protein. Well, they're going to do it again. They actually already are doing it. The general public just is not aware of it yet. They've got a six-year head start, and this is a global industrial food shift. You're having people, you know, let's talk about your home homeland of Ireland. They're calling 200,000, basically, uh, you know, cattle. And they're doing this to sheep, cattle, hogs, poultry. Across this planet, they're calling what is calling means? Well, they're killing them and they're not going to give anybody market access because they under the guise of climate change, they're they're actually now have convinced the same people that brought you that wonderful marketing plan called COVID, which was a global marketing plan to fear and you know, fear monger everybody into compliance. 
Well, they're doing this with food as well. They're turning basically an idealism. Of you're basically going to save the planet by not eating animal protein anymore. What does that mean? They're not giving you market access to true food anymore is what they're doing. And whenever that happens, they don't have to control you anymore than nutritional starvation. And that's what's going on. The United States has proven that with our metabolical destruction. And so people are going to wake up that and you, you can speak to it. You can see it everywhere is that they are not going to allow us to have market access to the types of proteins that we've had in the past. And they're going to t I tell everybody in the United States, they're going to turn beef into caviar. What do I mean by that? Well, they're going to price you out of it and you're not going to have market access to it. Beef and lamb is not going away. They're just not going to give the market access to the plebs and to the peasants anymore. They'll price you out of it, or they'll just eliminate your market access to it altogether. Where does that happen? Through processing and so distribution. And so if you are not really realizing where food truly comes from, then you're not going to have market access to the best nutrition out there that you should be able to be consuming and you should be able to be feeding your families just like your grandparents gave to you. Sure. What would you say to, what would you say to a man in the street who let's say they listen to this podcast or they, and they listen to the Safedine podcast with a guy who wrote uh, Fiat food. What would you say to the man and this guy who listens and he thinks to himself, this is kind of beyond uh, what is acceptable. This is a giant form of deception that goes, you know, goes beyond anything. This is damaging to health. This is damaging. This is intergenerational uh, health damage yeah. that can be caused by this. So, where would a, let's say a man, a, a guy who has no experience of Bitcoin or any kind of activism, like what could he do to kind of protect himself and to make sure that you know things work out better in the future for him? Well, you you have to get back to the source, the seed of what is the truth in food where you stand okay you you gotta quit looking at this we live like you said we're in this metaverse you know we're right now you're you're in thailand i'm in texas okay we're we live in a digital world and so people need to get perspective uh you need to find basically why do you desire what you desire within food why do you think that you're hungry when you shouldn't be hungry why do you eat four hours a day, every four hours there's so many things the individual has to ask first to have, you have to get grounded. Why do I, why do I consume what I consume? Who is controlling that consumption model? My audio, my video, and my food. Why do I basically, you know, why do I listen to doctors? If we are so damn smart in medical and health, why are we the unhealthiest that we've ever been as a species right now? This new phenomenon of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, fatty liver disease, this is something new to humanity, and a lot of people don't even realize that. You, the individual, have to go to the accountability mirror and you have to answer that question. Why do I desire what, when I eat food? Is it based on convenience or is it based on survival? Our ancestors, my grandfather taught me that food is survival and not a convenience. You use it to make you empowered, not to be decadent or for it to taste good. Well, we need to get back. Where is your energy source? Where is that individual that you speak of? Where do they find that energy source that their grandparents used to steward, they honored, and they basically facilitated through a market access peer-to-peer -peer system? I tell everybody, go shake a rancher's hand. That's what you need to do. You need to find a way to do that. I'm not saying you like if you're in the middle of Manhattan, you know, New York City, you're not going to be able to go shake a rancher's hand. What you have to do is you have to ask yourself, what do I know? Where do I start? Well, you start with the Beef Initiative. You go to thebeefinitiative.com and you learn. You re-educate yourself. What is food? What are the pillars of nutrition and how can I create market access for me, the individual, so I can feed my family, so I can tell everybody in my community, this is what I'm doing. If you are afraid to talk about what you're consuming, that means you are part of the deception because you're not forthright. 
And so I tell everybody, I eat a shit ton of beef. I eat eggs. I eat butter. I eat everything they tell me that I'm not supposed to eat. I'm proud about it. And I stand by because I feel pretty damn good. I'm in my 50s. I see a lot of men in their 30s, in the 40s that I can run circles around. And that's not me being boastful. It means that people need to look in the mirror saying, why am I consuming what I'm consuming? And then have the, uh, have the tenacity and the integrity to go out there and quit validating the deceptions. Once you can accept that there's deceptions, if you continually, as the individual, continually dis, uh, basically validate those deceptions, then you're living in a lie when it comes to food. And so that means that you're living in a lie with the money, you're living in a lie within your nutrition, and you're basically being engineered into a consumption model that's not going to make you the best that you could be. Simple as that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, again, my my memory goes back to my childhood with my grand, grandmother and grandfather. My grandmother's actually still alive. She's 95 years old. And Congratulations. She only, she only stopped working as a full-time uh, cook about four years ago. So she worked full time in a, in a ladies golf club for, uh, until she was, until she was 91. But just to use her as an example and use that generation, I suppose, as an example, like when you went to her house, no matter which night of the week it was, there she was in the kitchen, there's vegetables, there's meat, there's potatoes, there's gravy. There's, you know, you've got, you've got pudding in there. There's lots of butter involved. Um, you could, you know, there's you could plenty, plenty of uh, wine, etc., and beers go on the go as well. Um, but never, you know, she would never want to go to any restaurant because she said, you know, why would I go to a restaurant when I know the stuff they put in the food? Also, why would I go to the restaurant when I know my own food is better at home and it's better value? <laughs> um, so exactly, there's there's definitely some there's definitely a some truth to be to be learned from from that particular generation would you agree <laughs> oh 100 percent. i mean that's called an elder's doctrine and that's one of the my basically narratives of of thailand why why is slim in thailand why is this texas cowboy keep on going back to thailand well thailand is land of smiles but it's also you know it's it's basically they have something called an elder's doctrine and this is what you just spoke of. It's an elder's doctrine. It's wisdom. It's wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is action. Okay, what was your mother doing every day? She was making sure that her wisdom was passed on through action. See, you just basically were able to communicate the elder's doctrine. And this is what we've lost in Western society is the elder's doctrine of food. And anybody that knows their grandparents and they can reminisce and then they can speak to their of their grandmother in a kitchen. Well, this is exactly what we have to get back to. We have to get back to the elders doctrine of food. We have to get back to the wisdom of food, which requires action. And that's what your grandmother basically, it was a pioneer. And she didn't even know it. Your mother's mm -hmm. wisdom, her elder's doctrine will now live on forever because you're going to make sure that everybody knows about that. It should be a conversation piece. It should be something that, why do we go to restaurants? Well, we want to, you know, maybe it's celebration, but you're, she's right. I mean, my restaurant is my dinner table. I, I, nobody could cook, cook a steak like I can cook a steak. And then once again, let's get back in the United States of America. Let's go to Procter and Gamble back in 19, early 1900s. I'm sure safety and might be able to speak to this as far as, you know, his, his research, but what, is, what happened to Procter and Gamble? Well, they were the number one candle maker in the world and they made soap. Okay. What did they make that out of? Cotton seed. Okay. What happened whenever we had electricity. Well, they quit selling so many candles. What did they do with that commodity of that cotton seed? Well, they turned it into Crisco. What were we using before Crisco? We were using tallow. What is tallow? Well, that's suet. What is suet? That's animal fat. That was from the cow. So what they did is they supplemented the mindset of the American heritage woman. And they said, hey, you don't have to, you know, you need to be more decadent. 
this is a look at you, world class. You're international now because you're using Crisco. And so there's been a big marketing plan to change that wisdom of action of that elder's doctrine of what true food is. And your grandmother knew exactly what true food is. And uh, so lots of uh, hats off to your grandmother. I think another another problem these days is just with the amount of money print, printing uh, fraudulent, let's call it fraudulent behavior by uh, the powers that be, which is just causing the prices of everything to go absolutely through the roof and making it unaffordable for most families. Therefore, mother and father sure. both have to work. Mother and father both have to work all the hours under the sun, which means there's you know restricted amounts of time for mother to be in the kitchen whipping up all these wonderful traditional uh, recipes. So it's it's very very it's 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 everything is you know the inflation caused by government is, seems to be kind of messing up all of this stuff. Um, but of course there there'll be some kind of convenient solution provided, which is more yeah. unhealthy. And then obviously that'll tie then into the pharmaceutical companies that will provide you with a drug that'll make you better. So it seems to be a bit of a, yeah. a bit of a, I don't know. It all seems to be tied up with a nice bow on it so that the the corporations make a tidy profit. Would you agree? hundred percent. And that's what happened in the seventies. We'll just keep on going back to 1971. Whatever you commoditize and subsidize, people don't even know what that means means that basically it doesn't have any value, okay? So it gets subsidized. There's supplementation that goes on to basically a food product that is supplemented. Who supplements it? Well, the government does. Why does that happen? Well, it's because the multinational corporations are making ungodly amounts of profits off of your consuming of that food. And so the more that they can basically make it taste good, the more that they can... Uh, do that deception to where you're not understanding that this is really even food anymore, but you just can't live without it because you just keep on eating and eating it. That's the mass subsidization of our consumption that we did. And I was a product of the seventies. You know, I grew up of course with the freezer full of beef, but in my childhood, uh, you know, in the seventies, you talk about the parents, both parents having to go to work. That's what happened in the 70s. Everybody look at the 70s and all you status out there, all you researchers, especially in the Bitcoin space, look at what happened to uh, divorce in the United States of America in the 70s. It's known as the decade of divorce. So inflation. OK, we got another taxpayer now. Mom's now not in the kitchen. Now she's out working. We got more tax that divides the family. Oh, nobody's cooking anymore. Microwave. You had all these fake commodities that were now, you had pot pies, TV dinners, everything just started hitting big time in the 70s. And that's exactly what you were speaking of. That's that's inflating us. It's inflating us out of our, our culture. It's inflating us out of our the mindset of what, you know, my parents were the first generation removed off the farm. They had a they didn't have a chance, man. They didn't understand debt. They didn't understand the debt economy. All they knew was basically how to prepare meals in the kitchen. So my core nutritional delivery to me never changed. I wasn't eating from a microwave. I was still eating from that freezer full of beef. And I can speak to that. And now that you look at the United States of America and really anywhere in the world, this is how far we've gotten with that inflation of food. United States of America, the government will not even put CPI into food. Why do they do that? As well, so they can keep on price manipulating it. And that's that's what happens. And it, it's, it is, it's fraud. It's 100% fraud. A lot of times it takes a lot of people, it, it takes time to understand this. But once again, accountability, Mary. You know, I, the Beef Initiative is not a marketing plan. This is a call to action. Yeah, if you have ears to hear and eyes to see, you, the solution's right in front of you. If you're going to combat this or or deny it, well, good luck. <laughs> That's all I can say, man. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm trying to share with you. I'm trying to give to you, you know, intelligence that you don't have access to. And so we'll be here waiting for you whenever you're ready. And it is. It's a funnel. The Beef Initiative is a big old funnel of education, awareness, call to action. It's everything that are, uh, all the Bitcoiners say, they, say that they are. And I, I, 
I don't have a problem calling people out anymore because the beef initiative was established on the Bitcoin ethos. And what is one of our biggest mottos in Bitcoin is that, hey, you cannot trust that unless you have verified it. So I ask everybody, what did you eat this morning? Can you verify that it's pure and true? Most people can't. I can. I had eggs. That I know the producer. I know exactly where that egg came from. I had butter. I know exactly where that butter came from. I eat beef for breakfast. I know exactly where that cow was right when it was born until basically it's on my plate. And so if everybody starts living like that, especially the Bitcoin space first, we'll start showing. If people want adoption of Bitcoin, start living in truth and food. And then you will get far more and you'll have far more success about adoption of Bitcoin because you're, you're proof of work. You know, this is a lifestyle. This is an international lifestyle. We don't have any borders, man. This is about sound money, sound health, and sound, basically, a sound future. And, and, and this it all comes together. And if you can live by that ethos, then this is not daunting. This is not a, you know, the people out there with cognitive dissonance, you know, there's a hard case cognitive dissonance out there right now. And it's a confirmation bias that, that is now becoming deadly. Because this this industrial food shift is happening. You look what's happening in the Netherlands right now. You know they're taking they're taking all that land in the Netherlands. Look what's happening in Ireland with all the culling of the animal protein. Look what's happening in the United States with uh, Bill Gates and China buying up uh, you know over a half of, what over five hundred thousand acres of land. And farmland in the United States now is owned by China and Bill Gates. And that all happened right under the guise of COVID. There's something happening here and people better start looking at it instead of looking at like people. I get, you know, a lot of people look at me and they're like, yeah, whatever. You know, he's just uh, he's LARPing out there. He's, he's you know trying to get attention. No, folks, this shit's happening and people are going to see sure. it. And if, right. you, if you if you if you're if you're going to deny it, then you, that's up to you.